We just let people become part of our family. That's right. Amen. And today that's what we're going to talk about. We're going to talk about family. Let the kids go to kids' church and then we'll get started. If you got your Bibles, would you open them, please? I know we put the words on the wall, but you know, that just don't cut it with me. I know some of you have cell phones and tablets and that just don't cut it with me. I like something I can put my hand on, something I can feel, something I can touch. I'm a, I'm a dinosaur, ain't I? Yeah, I am. I am. There's a story I heard one time about three young men who went to college together, and when they got there, they found they were all three from different denominations, and so they'd go to each other's church to see the differences in the church, and whoever was the man in charge in his church, he'd sit in the middle, and the other two guys, one on each side, so they could discreetly ask questions. When they came to the Pentecostal young man's church, the preacher got up and he took his watch off and he put it up on the pulpit. And immediately both the young men turned and said, what does that mean? And he said, absolutely nothing. Now I want to warn you right now. I have a message and I will not stop until it's delivered. If you get finished before I do, leave quietly. But I have a message for you today that has been welling up in me for months. I'm not the greatest preacher in the world. Don't claim to be. Don't want to be. Come on, come on. Go to the Gospel of John, the 10th chapter. Ruffle some pages if you got them. I like to hear the pages ruffle. I like to see people getting in the Word of God. John chapter 10, verse 10. The thief comes not but to steal and to kill and to destroy. Mm -hmm. right. Who's the thief? Come on, talk to me. Who's the thief? That's, that's, that, old, that's that old thing we talk about all the time. That old evil thing. But you know, sometimes I'm him. <coughs> Sometimes I am healed. But let's finish that verse. Jesus said, But I am come that they might have life and they might have it more abundantly. All right. What's abundance? Abundance is to everyone where their heart is. Abundance at some point in my life was having a lot of money. I had a lot of money. I went bankrupt. I was sitting in church and I said I was praying, but I was whining and crying to myself. Oh, what am I going to do? I went to bed last night. I was worth $100,000 and woke up this morning. I'm worth the $20 bill I got in my pocket. What am I going to do? And the Lord said, well, now that we've got some money out of the way, maybe you'll do what I asked you to do a long time ago. <coughs> Wait a minute. I'm supposed to ask you? I'm supposed to do what you told me when I'm flat broke. You took every penny away from me. And now, oh yeah, now is when I'm supposed to serve you. Now is when I'm supposed to be touched by you. Now is when I'm supposed to turn to you. Not when everything's all roses and sunshine. But when I have my ski and axe, I mean my, my ankle broke here or whatever it is. But... When we get into the idea that everything has to be right before we can do, right. you'll never do. Right. You will never, ever do. Right. Yeah. In 1 Samuel, the 30th chapter, most of you are familiar with it, David came back to Ziglag. Guess what? It wasn't there anymore. The raiders had come. They'd stolen everything. Not just the material thing, but they'd stolen the people. Wouldn't you hate to live in a nation where, and, and in that area, that was common. When you captured the city, you took its people too. And they became your slaves. So David has a little problem on his hand. 
He's got 600 violent men. Yeah, there were. There were a bunch of thugs. That's who followed David in the beginning. When David came out of the wilderness and began to develop relationships, it was with the outcasts. It wasn't with the good guys. They didn't wear the white hats. They were the bad actors. And now these men that he knows, and he knows how violent they are, he knows what they can do, he know, he's seen the way they behave in the battle, and they're sitting over there saying, okay, David, you're the one that took us off over here and got us lost and then brought us home and everything's gone. I think we'll just stone you to death. That was no joke. David faced that. That was a reality. That was an absolute reality. They were going to kill the leader. Well, that's the way it happens. Lots of times, lots of places, things go wrong. You kill the leader. You look at sports. When a team doesn't perform, you can't fire the whole team, so you fire the manager. You fire whoever the head coach is. You get rid of the, the man that has the power because he's supposed to lead. He's not supposed to have bad things happen. Poor pitiful me. But David said he encouraged himself in the Lord. Hmm. You know the first thing we need to do when adversity comes? Wait a minute. I'm a child of the God of the universe. I am a child. I've been adopted, chosen, picked out, selected to be a child of the king. Anybody in here been adopted? Have you been physically adopted in the natural? Anybody here been adopted in the natural? When a person is adopted, I know this personally because I adopted three boys. I married a woman that had three beautiful young boys, and I couldn't wait for them to be my sons. I really couldn't. I wanted to adopt those boys. God wanted to adopt you. God wants you to be his child. He wants you to learn that you can trust him. Why do we come to church? Why do we read the word? It's not so we can be able to quote all the scripture in the world. It's so we can know who God is and what he expects of us and what we can expect of him. My number two son was kind of a clown. <laughs> and of course you always got to be careful you don't love somebody extra when you have more than one but the the problem was that Charlie could not do anything but be a joker right, right. I mean it was in his bones he was always the clown so he would we combined two families and so I had some things and they had some things and Charlie wanted to prowl through my stuff because it was all new to it He's about eight years old. And uh, so I keep telling him, Charlie, he said, can I look at your this or your that? And I said, no, now, Charlie, it's not mine and yours. It's ours now. When God claimed you as a child, it's ours now. His power, his strength, his ability all belongs to you. If you're a child of God. So I keep telling Charlie, no, no, Charlie, it's not my stuff, it's our stuff. And one day we're sitting at the kitchen table and he said, all this stuff is all of ours now, right? And I said, yeah. He said, well, can I have, a, can I have our billfold? I want to go to town. <laughs> I said, well, well, wait just a minute. We, we're not going to go that far with it. You're eight years old. <laughs> But God wants us to recognize who he is. Right. People ask all the time, what's my purpose in life? Everything's going wrong. 
I can't do anything for God. Can't even take care of myself. What's, what's my purpose? What am I going to do? How am I going to get through this? You're going to get through it by the power of the Spirit and by the Word of God. If you want to know why you're in the situation you're in, ask God. Nancy and I got some really bad news the other day. And uh, she has another health problem and we'll deal with it. God's got this. I'm not worried about it. Take care of it. And I'm getting ready to go see the doctor to talk to him about her condition. And I'm thinking all these questions. Well, what about this? What about that? And the Lord spoke to me and said, don't you think before you speak to him, you need to speak to me? How many times has something happened and you've simply jumped in and done your thing and then realized if I'd have waited just a minute, if I'd have taken just a little bit of time, if I'd have said, Lord, what do you want me to do in this? What are you trying to get out of this? What are you trying to show me out of this? It's not always punishment. Sometimes it's just pure and simple instruction. But we're so hard-headed, it takes a hard way to get us to listen. David could have listened to the men talking about, we're going to stone that sucker and kill him and run off and hit himself. But David was smarter than Job. David was smart enough to go and talk to the Lord first and find out, what can I do? And the Lord said, go get them. He said, am I going to get them all? You're going to get it all back. Nothing will be lost and nothing lost. It may not always be the same, but everything that happens is designed to end up bringing glory to God. Boy, I tell you, sometimes that's hard to understand. I've uh, had a very colorful life, and at one point my wife left me for my best friend. And as the old joke says, and I sure did miss him, but, <laughs> but I'm going down the highway on my motorcycle, and I'm, again, said I'm praying, but I'm really just whining. You know, I'm all what am I going to do? How am I going to do this? Huh? This ain't never going to work out. And the Lord has been so good to speak to me so many times. And he said, if you're who you say you are, praise me. Well, that's pretty blunt. My life's a toilet. You know, what do you mean? Praise you. If you are what you say you are. You will praise Him. Not for the thing you're in, but while you're in the thing you're in. Anybody can praise God when the victory comes. I can praise God when I'm well, but can I praise God when I'm sick? I can praise God when I don't have any pain, whenever that may be someday. But can I praise Him while I'm in pain? Can I pray, praise Him while I'm losing as well as while I'm winning? Can I praise Him when I don't have enough money to feed my family for the next week as well as praise Him if I've got $10,000 in the bank? Woo! That's the test. Mm -hmm. So what's your first response when things don't go your way? You know what I hear most of the time? Well, how come? Why? Why me? I don't deserve to be treated this way. Oh, my God. What's the matter? God don't love me no more. No. You're your worst enemy when you do that. You are absolutely your worst enemy when you begin to look and ask why. Why is such a waste of time? And why not you? Am I so special? That God should give me a free pass? Am I so wonderful and good and talented and smart and it? No. I'm just another person. God loves me. But even the word tells us, doesn't it, very plainly, 
Many are the afflictions of the righteous, but the Lord, but the Lord delivers them from out of them all. I knew a man made a joke out of that. He said, I'm not supposed to go shopping my, with my wife because the Bible says the Lord delivers me from the mall. <laughs> but that's really not it. But we need to understand that's what we have to keep as the forefront of our thought. Yeah, this is bad. This is terrible. This doesn't feel good. This hurts my feelings. It hurts my pride. Hurts my pocketbook. Hurts my health. But God yeah. had a plan. Yeah. Don't get in the way of his plan by saying I've got to have it my way. So why me? No, I'm not that special. No, I'm not. I really don't have any special thing that God can overlook me and say, don't hurt him. Just let him have a free ride. <laughs> free rides cost more than the one you pay for. Maybe we need to learn to be thankful. You ever think about that? Thank you, Lord, that I only broke my back instead of severing my spinal cord. I had that experience. I broke my back and I was sitting in church in pain one day. And I said, Lord, why do I have so much pain? This is really hard for me to be here. And again, the Lord spoke to me and said, well, you could have no feeling at all from the waist down. Would you like that? I said, no, no, I'll take the pain. I'm okay. See, because it's a matter of degrees. Everything in the world is by a process. Nothing happens independent, totally out here on its own. Everything that happens, good, bad, or indifferent, is part of the process. Quit try, trying to isolate individual problems and say, oh, well, this is it. I'm done. Can't happen. How do we deal with those things? How do we deal with disappointment? When someone really lets you down, when that person that you thought would be your friend forever walks out on you. Woo! We all been there, haven't we? I'll bet half of us or more have been divorced. I've been divorced twice. I don't hide things. I made two terrible mistakes. I chose people without talking to the Lord about it. I made decisions on what I wanted, I thought. And then I found out what I wanted really wasn't what was best for me. But when I didn't make a choice, when I said, Lord, I don't think I ever want to do that again, guess what? The most wonderful woman in the world walked into my life. She's been with me for 27 years. Well, actually 28. But when we think that we're special, when we shouldn't have things happen to us wrong, when everything ought to be all sweet and honey and all that, we overrate ourselves terribly. We're just kids. We're children of God. In church one time a man said, I thought I was really somebody. And he said, and I'm kind of getting proud of myself. And the Lord kind of brought me down and said, you know, son, You'll always be a child to me. You'll always. Think about your own children. They'll always be your children. When you're 80 and they're 50, 60 years old, they're still your child. So we're still God's children. We've been adopted. We've been chosen. We've been selected. I didn't have to adopt those three boys. I wanted to. God didn't have to adopt you. He wanted to. He wanted you to be part of his family. So learn to be thankful. Learn to focus on other people's troubles as well as your own. Yeah. You know, one of the worst things that most of us do is that we think the problem we've got is the worst one ever was. I used to work in medicine and we had a little joke that said major sur surgery is anything they do to me and minor surgery is anything they do to you. Right. Well, that's the way most of us are about our problems. My problems are all majors. Yours don't amount to squat. 
And so we need to cultivate the understanding that my problems should be as important to you as your problems are to me. We should cultivate being in tune with each other. That's why fellowship is so important. That's why it's so important to come together as a church. I can't come like I used to. I'm old and things change. But I can come when I can and get the fellowship we need and try to see, is there someone here that the Lord will give me an eye or an ear to that I can help? That's why I come to church. I don't come to church so I'll get blessed. I come to church hoping that God will use me to bless someone else. When I pray at night, and I don't get me wrong, I'm not bragging about me. I'm just giving you some little instructions. When I pray at night, one of the things I almost always ask for is, Lord, put someone in my path that I can be a blessing to. You do that? Cultivate those things. Learn to think on those things. So, have you never been disappointed? How do you deal with all that? God never said, follow me and you'll have no problems. Right. He never said that. Right. He said, I'll be with you through the problems. Right. I'll see you on the other side. When Jesus told the disciples, we're going to go to the other side and the storm came up, they were scared to death. Right. Why? Because they didn't understand that if he said we're going to the other side, we're going to get to the other side. Yeah. We'll have a storm, but we're not going to drown because the Lord said we're going to the other side. God has good plans for you. Yeah. Isn't that what the word says? I know my plans for you. They're to do you good, not evil. Right. To bless you, not curse you. Right. So, some people... Get in a little pity party and feel sorry for themselves. Oh, I've got the worst problems anybody ever had. No. There's an old poem I heard when I was in junior high. I can only remember the last line of it. And it simply said, I once complained because I had no shoes till I met a man who had no feet. Think about that. When you're looking on yourself and feeling sorry for yourself, and saying, oh, I've got it worse than anybody. Stop and think for just a minute. You don't. This man right here behind me, he changed my whole attitude. When I first met him, I'd say, how you doing, Brother Calvin? He'd say, I won't complain. Not I don't have a complaint. I won't complain. Learn to not complain. You know, pastor said last week that when we come out of the, the fire, we want people to smell our smoke. Well, that's exactly what we do when we keep feeding that problem and feeding that problem. Learn to say, thank you, Lord, it could have been worse. Thank you, God, it could have been a whole bunch worse. Other people quit. People have adversity and they just give up. So they don't fold their hands. Anybody in here ever been in a fight? I mean a real bodily, physical fight. I'm not too proud of it, but I've been in a few. When you quit, you've got no chance of winning. None whatsoever. There was a, I used to be a great boxing fan and, and, and fought for a little while. And um, found out that it. I like dishing it out a whole lot more than I like taking it, so I quit fighting. But, <laughs> but I heard a story about a, a heavyweight fighter who was on a comeback, and uh, he was really good. He, he came out of Kansas City, Missouri, and I was living in that area at the time. And uh, he made a deal with his manager. He said, no one stops my fights but me or the referee who is the only legal one that can stop them. And so he's trying to come back and get back up on top. They match him with a young man and this young man just eats his lunch and trashes his lunchbox. 
And he is getting a whipping like he never had. And his manager says, don't you think we ought to quit? No, I can whip that man. I can whip him. Kept fighting, kept fighting. Four rounds, five rounds, six rounds, seven rounds. He comes back, sits down on the stool and says, I'm done. Call it off. Manager after the fight said, son, why did you take such a beating before you gave up? He said, because I knew I could whip him. He said, well, then why did you quit? I was paying too high a price for the victory. Sometimes we have to quit what we're doing and let God heal us and start over again. You know, if you keep beating on a wall, thinking there's a door there and there's no knob, you're probably not going to get through that wall. Sometimes we chase after people. We chase after things that God's trying to separate us from. Trying to get us to give it up. And we just keep chasing after it, chasing after it. Mm -hmm. Don't quit. But then when you finally hear, get your, your brain kind of scrambled enough to make sense, you have to think, now wait a minute. Why am, I, why am I still fighting? Why is this still a battle for me? Why am I doing this? If God says do it, keep fighting. But talk to him. Ask him. The Holy Spirit will tell you whatever you need to know. But you've got to ask. You've got to say, Lord, what is the point? Where am I going with this? Is this really where you want me? And do that on a regular basis. You can't quit. Jesus didn't quit. You can't quit being a disciple. You can certainly quit doing a lot of other things that, that are extraneous stuff you don't need. I used to smoke and drink and cuss and all those things. And I just praise God that I was delivered because I don't have that anymore. And now I'm in a lot better shape than I used to be. And yet, sometimes what I do is what God gave me by taking me off all that stuff. What did I do? Now, some of us are old dopers. And some of us are old drunks. And some of us are old philanderers. And some of us are all kinds of things. Paul said, and some of us were those. And we were. But when God changed you, when he took those things away from you, why did he do that? To give you a new start. To give you a new chance. Don't even think about going back to that. I don't think about going back to the whiskey bottle. And I'll tell you the truth, I loved it. I enjoyed the taste of it. I enjoyed the way it made me feel. I was 10 feet tall and bulletproof. Nobody could hit me. Nobody could hurt me. Well, they could hit me, but they couldn't hurt me, you know. You get enough of that stuff in you, you don't feel it. It's like an anesthetic. Next day you feel all of it, but, you know, that's beside the point. When you are delivered, what do you do with your deliverance? Do you just walk around the rest of your life saying, Oh, thank you, Lord, I've been delivered. Well, that's good. Yeah, I thank him all the time I've been delivered. But I do not just stay there. Develop yourself by the Spirit of God. New converts in the prison, many times they'll say, Well, what am I supposed to do now? What, what am I supposed to give up? I said, Don't ask me. Ask the Holy Spirit to tell you. Don't be surprised when he tells you something you don't want to hear. So maybe I won't quit. I'll just pout, have a pity party. Yeah, but I'm sure going to tell everybody about all my problems. And I'm going to tell them about all their faults. I'm going to say, well, you know, I used to be that, but I'm better now. No, I'm not. I'm just delivered and redeemed. I'm no better than anyone. I pray literally every day of my life. Lord, never let me forget who I used to be. So I never will be him again. Because I don't want to be him anymore. I don't want to be the same old guy. I want to be a new creation. When God adopted us, he gave us the right to be called his sons and daughters. My boys are my boys. 
They're not stepchildren. Who in the world invited, invented a name like stepchild? What in the world does that even mean? There are no stepchildren in God's kingdom. We're all God's children. And if we've all got the same father, why aren't we brothers and sisters like we're supposed to be? I know in this congregation, we work on blending together. But many places, you go sit in some, some pew that bl belongs, in quotes, to somebody, they'll ask you to get up and move. I pastored a church in Missouri one time, and an old man came in, and there was a, a family sitting on a pew, and he stood there and looked at them a while, and he said, well, that's my pew. I guess you don't need me anymore, and walked out of the church. Of course, I went to his house right after service, and we had a little conference, but the truth of the matter is many people never get the full understanding that if I'm a child of God, and you're a child of God, then we're brothers and sisters. We, we use that term to remind us of that, not to make us better than anybody. You know, I, I had somebody ask me one time, ah, how come y'all talk that old brother and sister stuff? That's to remind me. Leslie's my sister. I can't have bad thoughts about her. I can't be condemning her. I can't be desiring her. I can't be having anything other than a godly relationship with her because she's my sister. We're all brothers and sisters. If you have a problem with that, you have a real problem. So I won't quit. I'll feel sorry for myself and I'll make sure everybody else that, that I talk to will feel sorry for me too. And, yeah, well, I'm trying so hard. Quit trying. Quit trying. Just have faith in God. Just say, Lord, you've got this. I don't know what I'm doing. I don't know what's going to happen. I don't have any idea. I don't know whether Nancy will live another week or another year or another five years. I don't know any of that. But I know the man who does. I know the God of the universe because I've read about him in his book. I've studied him. I've listened to his word. I have heard him speak to me. I have listened and I've learned. Oh. You know, the biggest cause of our failures is not Satan. The biggest cause of our failures is us. Many, many years ago, you got to be about my age to even remember him, there was a little cartoon character named Pogo Possum. And it was a little political satire, really, is what it was. And at one time, he and his crew go on a, a quest, and they're trying to locate the enemy. And they come back, and Pogo said, we found the enemy, and it's us. When you really find yourself, you realize you can be your own worst enemy. When you allow that little ache or pain to become a major problem, it keeps you from doing what God's asked you to do. You're your own worst enemy. When you allow your feelings to get into your life to the point that you're hateful with someone who really loves you. You're your own worst enemy. You're failing yourself over and over again, and you're reinforcing that failure. God wants you to understand He has all this under control. There's no point in us getting all political and going on Facebook and condemning this party and that party and this politician and that politician. God knows what's going on. Take them to the Lord in prayer. Ask God. Ask Him. Sometimes He even reminds me, like I told you a while ago. He said, don't you think you ought to talk to me before you talk to the doctor? Well, absolutely. Absolutely.
things don't work out your way, it may be because you went off on your own direction. It may be because you didn't take time to talk to God. If things go wrong, it just might be Joe's fault. If God gave me a, a fistful of money, which I don't even care about anymore, but if he did, and I just went out and blew it, and then I couldn't meet my payments again, it's not God's fault. That's my fault. If I'm married to a wonderful woman, and I have a bad day, and I come home and kicking, kicking the dog and cussing my wife, and she decides to leave me, that's not her fault. That's my fault. If I don't have the relationship with you that I want to have with you, that's not your fault. It's up to me to initiate that. It's up to me to let God get in the middle of it. Oh, Lord. Sometimes, though, we really are wrong. And that's so hard to admit. Anybody ever have to just fess up to the fact that you really, really blew it? hurts, doesn't it? But you know, it's one of the best lessons you'll ever learn. Learn how to just face yourself as the imperfect person you are and realize that in spite of that, God loved you enough, he wanted to call you his daughter or his son. Isn't that amazing? How could God even think about it? How could God even love me. I used to tell people, I spent the first 32 years of my life learning to be the nastiest little man I could. And boy, I got good at it. How could God love me? But he did. How could God have loved what I was? I've told you before, when my brother and my wife were talking and she said, the only regret I have is I didn't meet Joe when we were both younger. And my brother started laughing. And she said, what's so funny? He said, honey, if you'd known him when he was young, you wouldn't even have liked him, much less loved him. How could God love me? But he did. And he called me to be his son. He called me to be his child. He adopted me. He brought me into his family. He made me something I never would have been on my own. Yeah. If you love someone enough to want to spend time with them, magnify that more times than you can imagine, and that's how God loves you. And yet, he demands that we try to live up to his standards. When I adopted those boys, sometimes when they do things wrong, I'd say, excuse me, guys, your name's Hogan now. Hogan's don't do that. We don't behave that way. We don't vandalize things. We don't pick fights. We don't do this. We don't do that. But the Word of God tells me what God tells me I need to not do and what I need to do in order to be really His Son. Get in the Word. Some of us read the Word and close it. Some of us read the Word and we study it. Some of us pick it apart. But just read it and hear what God's saying to you. Do not try to get through this life without putting your head in this book every day of your life. Because there is the truth. Paul said, in the gospel, you think you have salvation. Yeah, we do. But you've got to look for it. You've got to find it. You gotta, and then you've got to live it out. Yeah. It's awful good to talk. You know, we used to have an expression out in Oklahoma that kind of summed up a lot of people in the way they believe. It said, don't let your blue jay mouth overload your hummingbird behind. And sometimes we talk a whole lot more than we do. And if you will look at yourself, nobody will judge you. You'll judge yourself by the word of God. And you'll say, wait a minute. I said it, but do I really believe it? When we sing these beautiful hymns and we go through all this, 
Do you really understand what you're reading, what you're singing? Are you really meaning that? Or are you just singing the words because it's a beautiful sound? Right. Are you just listening to the beautiful voice of Rita and the other singers up here? Or are you really hearing what that is saying to you? Do you really love the Lord that much? Do you really? If you love someone, you want to be with them. You want to share with them. You want to encourage them to be with you. You want to get the things out of the way that block you from being with them. One of the reasons I quit drinking was because I wanted to spend time with my wife. I wanted to be with her, and I wanted to remember everything we did. I wanted to know the next day what we had done. I didn't want to wake up the next morning and say, uh, how did we get home last night? Yeah. No. Well, that's the way we're all with God. We read the Word. We find out what it says. Uh, yeah, but, you know, I can't really do that. Oh, yes, you can. There's no temptation comes upon us that God doesn't already provide the way to escape. It's in the Word. You don't have to do anything that isn't approved to God. You choose to do it. It's all about choices. So I'm adopted. So what do I do when I'm adopted? I try to live the way my Father wants me to. I try to be as close to him as I can be. My boys went everywhere I went. My Lord, you'd have never known that they weren't born blood to me. When I was, oh, excuse me, a little vertigo, I don't drink anymore. <laughs> um, when, when I adopted my boys, they all had different last names. Isn't that something? Three boys, three different last names. When I got ready, I adopted the first two boys, and uh, the younger boy, his daddy was still around and trying to be a problem, and so I had to wait a little while for him. But when I filed to adopt him, Charlie, my little clown that wanted my wallet, was the happiest kid I ever saw in my life. He was about 11 or 12 by then. And I said, Charlie, why is this so important to you? He said, don't you realize for the first time in my life, my whole family will have the same last name. When we give ourselves to God, our whole family has the same name. Our whole family are the children of the Most High. Our whole family are saved and sanctified by the blood of Jesus. How can you talk about each other? How can we say bad things about each other? How can we look down on each other? We can't. It's against the rules. You can't do it anymore. You've got to accept God and let Him accept you. Are you adopted? Do you prove your adoption? Or do you reject it? Now, my boys could have rejected my adoption. They had the right in court to say, no, I don't want this man to adopt us. After I adopted them, they could have rebelled against me and fought me all the time. And, but they didn't. They chose to love me. Yeah. Have you really chosen to love the Lord and give him all there is of you? Ooh, that's a big order. But don't look at it, the whole, in one big piece. A man told me one time, his grandmother asked him, said, Son, do you know how to eat an elephant? And he said, Well, no, I sure don't. She said, One bite at a time, just like anything else. One bite at a time. If you're still struggling, if you're still having problems that keep flaring up, sometimes the same old thing over and over, take that one thing and talk to the Lord about it. Pray about it. Find the word that will fulfill whatever you need to be done about it. And allow God to work that out. Don't try to change your whole life at once. I didn't. I joined the church when I was 32 years old. They took a dim view of smoking, drinking, and cussing and several other things I was doing. And I was doing them all and made no bones about it. And 
I began to realize if I'm going to serve God, I've got to play the game by the rules. So I took it one step at a time. Let's take care of the filthy mouth first. That's a terrible embarrassment. Some Christians I know, you can't tell them from the world. You get to talking to them and the four-letter words that come out of them aren't love, work, and things like that. It's uh, the, the worst thing in the world. We have to first allow God to tell us what our priorities should be and then change to suit Him. Not to suit me, not to suit the pastor, not to suit your spouse, to suit the Lord. I had a friend in Joplin, Missouri who taught smoke stoppers when the uh, uh, state first passed their no smoking rules about everywhere. And he had a little spiel that he did in the beginning. And he would say, now, if you're here to quit smoking because your significant other was the word he used, I hate that. <laughs> That's the word he used, ask you to, or because you think it's going to be inconvenient, or any other reason than you want to quit, then just turn in your papers, pick up your check, and go home, and we'll teach the rest of the class. Because if you don't want to do it, it's never going to be. If you don't want to turn loose of your old life, you'll always hold on to part of it. You've got to cut the whole thing. When a baby's born and they cut the cord, they don't leave part of it dangling still keeping that baby tied to the placenta, they cut the cord completely. When I really decided to be a Christian and come back and do this thing, I cut the cord. I lost friends. I lost associates. I have family members that won't talk to me. I don't care. I cut the cord because I want to be here, not there where I used to be. You're a doctor. Chosen. Handpicked. God looked down on the world and said, I want them all, but I really want Sister Barbara. I want them all, but I really want Caleb. I want them all, but I really want Brother Earl. Oh, we're all called, drawn to the Spirit of God. Allow Him to do a work in you. Allow Him to change you. Allow him to make you what he wants you to be. I'm not what I wanted to be at all. I'm not even close. But I'm what God wants me to be. And I try every day. Okay, Lord, what's still in there that you don't like? <laughs> what's, what's still part of me that I need to work on? What do I need to do? How do I need to do it? I don't want to be like David. Have everybody ready to stone me. I want to be the child that God has got me and loved and brought to where he is. Oh, he's wonderful. There is nothing ever in my whole life that can even compare to being able to trust God in every situation. That doesn't mean I don't feel. It doesn't mean that I'm not disturbed when the doctor says what he's told us the other day. Of course that bothered me. But even before I heard those words, the Lord reassured me by saying, don't you think you ought to talk to me first? Don't you think you ought to find out what I think before you worry about what he thinks? He's a man. Educated. True. Talented. Yes. Wise in medicine. He ain't God. He's just another man. So I say, okay, Lord, we'll talk to you about it. Do I not feel things? Of course I do. I feel pain. I feel anger sometimes. But I don't let it get ahead of me. As soon as I feel that, you've got to get to know yourself. You've got to know what the signs are. You've got to know that, well, if, if somebody says this to me, I automatically flare up. I used to have a routine I'd go through. Things would go wrong. Oh, the first thing I'd do, I'd just quit. i give up. It's all over. End up. Nothing going to be. And then I'd say, well, maybe we'd better see what happened. 
then I'd say, okay, now let's solve the problem. Yes. And someone messed up, and I applied this to my family as well, because the Lord gave it to me. Okay. Brother Tony, I asked you to do a job, and you did it wrong. Now, this is what I wanted. This is what happened. How do we get from here to here? Problem solved. Problem solved. No anger. No animosity. I don't get feelings all built up against him. I don't have all the things that, that we allow into our lives. Again, we being our worst enemy, allow those things to come in. Well, you didn't do that right. Well, no, that's not how you solve the problem. If my wife burns the beans, I don't come in and say, my God, you burned the beans. I can smell them. She knows she burned the beans. I say, honey, what are we going to have for supper now? <laughs> Where do you want to eat <laughs> tonight? But we've got to learn to control our emotions and listen to what the Lord says, and you'll become so much wiser. And you'll become so much more content. So much completely satisfied. Because God satisfies us to the point that it's unbelievable. I mean, he says so in his word. Give you peace that defies understanding. How can you be at peace when your thing's going wrong? Because I know the peace giver. Because I know the one who will maintain my peace, will strengthen my peace, will absolutely give me his peace in all the situations. If I talk to him first. Yeah. Folks, it's real. I had a young man in here that was going through his rebellious period as a teenager. And I sat down next to him one day and I said, uh, you know, this is not what you think it is. You think church is just a way to control you, don't you? And his ears turned red and I knew it hit him right where it needed to. I said, it's not about control. It's about what's real. It's about the best life you'll ever live to live for Jesus. Yeah. It's not so mom and dad's got their thumb on your head. It's so you can understand. Why do I get up here and talk like this? Because I want you to have the peace I have. Yeah. I want you to be able to do things like I've done. I want you to be able to face problems like I've faced and not let them kill you. I want you to learn that God loved you enough that he chose you to be his child. He loved you that much. Maybe your mom and dad really didn't love you that much. Maybe, as one girl said, we were counseling one time, Nancy and I were counseling about the way she was raising her children, like one of heathens. I mean, just throw them out in the morning and drag them back in at dark. And I said, well, Barbara, how come you do that? She said, well, that's the way my mom raised me. She opened the door in the morning and kicked us out in the yard and opened the door back up at night and told us to come in the house. Doesn't matter what your parents did. Your father has a better plan. Doesn't matter what I learned, which was wrong. I have to unlearn that. And then I have to learn what the Lord wants. But I have to be willing. Willing to be changed. There's an old song we sing that has that in it. It says, I'm willing to be changed. Are you willing to be changed? I'm 80 years old. I'm still willing to be changed. You never get to the point where you don't need to change. You'll never get to the point where you've got it all together and everything's fine and perfect. and you know It'll never happen. You have to be willing to change as the Lord directs you. You can let the world change you. You can let circumstances change you. You can let your riches or your poverty change you. But if you want lasting, joyful change, let the Lord, through his word, change you. David strengthened himself in the Lord. Do you do the same? I challenge you to do that. Regularly. On everything. When I go home, go back to the house this afternoon, 
Nancy may not feel good. And she may not grab me and hug me and say, oh, I'm so glad you're home. But that's not going to change my feelings for her. I'm going to love her anyway. God's going to love you anyway. Oh, yeah, you messed up. You made a promise and you didn't keep it. You didn't get as far down the road as you thought you'd be by now. Things got in the way and we got sidetracked, didn't we, Marvell? And we went off on a little rabbit trail over here for a while. But God never quit loving us. He never gave up on you. He's just waiting for you to say, okay, Lord, here I am. Pick me up where I'm at. Take me where you want me to go. Show me the way. And I'll follow your path. Oh, what a marvelous thing. You're adopted, chosen, because he wanted you. That's the beauty of adoption. Oh, there's probably as many reasons to adopt as there are people that do it. But most of the people who adopt do it because they want to share their love with someone. God adopted you because he wants to share his love with you so you can share it with everybody else. Do that. It ain't hard. It's a pretty simple little thing. I'm going to kind of surprise myself. Whew, I got done. <laughs> We're going to take up the offering. A little joke about the offering. The fellow said one time, he kept putting different amounts in the offering. And finally, the preacher went back and asked him, said, how come you put a different amount in? And he said, well, it depends on how much I get out of the sermon, how much I give you. And so the preacher thought, well, I'm going to get better and better, you know. So he keeps preaching and money keeps coming. And one day he didn't feel real good and he didn't preach real vibrant and he didn't get any money. And the guy said, he said, well, how come you didn't give anything today? He said, well, you didn't either. <laughs> so I probably should have taken the offering before we started the message. But, <laughs> but we know about offering. It's part of our worship. It's part of our celebration. Offering is a time when we should be prepared for that. You don't get up in the morning and come to church and then put your clothes on. You get dressed and you shave or whatever you do, trim your beard or, or at least comb the crumbs out of it, whatever you do, and you come to church. You should come prepared to give. Every time you come to the house of God, be willing and ready to give. Father, we thank you for this opportunity to continue our worship and to celebrate you and to thank you that you've provided us with enough funds that we can occasionally help a little bit. Father, bless each one who gives. Give those who have a heart to give the encouragement to have the courage to give because, Lord, it is a thing we have to cultivate. We thank you for your blessings in Jesus' name. Ushers will come forward. You know the routine. We don't take it. You give it.
I don't preach like him. I don't sing like him. He don't preach or he don't sing like me. It's not predicated how I praise God. It's not predicated on who's sitting behind the keyboard. Who's behind the drums. I praise God because there's something inside of me that made me want to praise him. Because if it had not been for him, I know that I wouldn't be here. Thank God that you are here. But whether you praise God or not, I still got to praise God. Because, and I think Pastor has said it before, if it, was, if, it's, if it's your time, you want everybody to be screaming and hollering everybody behind you. So we got to get behind preaching. Brother Joe is not one that'll hoot and run up and down, up and down the aisle. Amen. But he had a word from God. And if you can't praise God because if you can't praise God because of the word, then you then you got a problem. Amen. How you can thank God for the music, but I don't need the music to praise God. When I think about where God has brought me from, where God has brought me to. When I was sick, I didn't have no music, but I had him. And I called on him, and I got excited because I was calling on him. It wasn't the music. Amen. So we thank God, amen, for Brother Joe this morning. Thank God for the word, amen, the encouragement, amen, that he brought to us this morning. Sometimes God don't come in a whirlwind. Sometimes he come in a small, still voice. Amen. And we got to hear what the spirit, amen, is saying to the church. Amen. So we want to get to the point where that the only reason I can holler, amen, because you is here. The only reason I can holler because sometimes I believe that God will put us through a test. Said so I'm not let the I'm not let the pianist be here. I'm not going to let the whole choir be here. But He said I'm going to still still play me with what's left because we don't want to never get to the point. The amen and pastor will tell you. I'm not telling you something that pastor wouldn't tell you. He will tell you that he don't want you to, to not one of us preachers, amen, to stand up and try to be a carbon copy of him. And we don't never want to get to the point that we stand up here and when we stand, we want to look around, we want everybody jumping and screaming and hollering for us. That's a sad state to be in, amen. But when the word is going forth, if you can't praise God when the word is going forth and you need some music to praise God, you're in a bad state. So we want to come here tonight, amen, and testify. And, and, and Whatever they had to make some, a joyful noise unto the Lord, that's what they did. So when we come into the house of God, we got to make a joyful noise. We just can't wait the next Sunday or next Monday or next Wednesday or next Friday, amen, to give God some glory because everybody. Amen. Good place to be in the house of the Lord this morning. I just praise God. I know I wake up every morning having a reason to praise God. He delivered me. He delivered me from uh, uh, many things. Uh, being an addict, he delivered me. He's helped me with my health. Uh, he just helps me every day. I'm glad that I can come and praise him in, the, in his midst today. Uh, we do have some announcements. Uh, doctrine class. If uh, Pastor Jerry's back and ready, we'll be tomorrow night at 7 p.m. And it's, it's just absolutely wonderful to dig into the Word of God. If you can be here, be here. If not, the streams is online. So let's everybody join in and learn about the Word of God. Uh, family fun night will be May the 28th at 6.30 p.m. Youth camp. Uh, it'll be June 23rd through 26th, ages 12 through 21. Uh, there's going to be a lot of people there, a lot of good times, and a lot of good learning in the Lord. Donations are welcome. We need up donations for snacks for the kids, church, and nursery. Please see Sister Les, Les Leader, Sister Shonda, or Sister Lydia for more information on that. And then we have Gavin, uh, the Carter household, Betts family, and Manning family. Uh, which is for some of uh, Bill Mar today at, at the funeral. Uh, Sister Margaret, uh, Brother Shannon, remember Brother Shannon, the Lord just touch him and heal him and, and give him strength that he needs to, to perform daily life duties. Uh, 
Sister Lindy, uh, Hugh Craft, Sister Mary Manny's mom, Sister Ashley, uh, and her baby. The Lord just touch her and keep them healthy. Uh, catch her family. Uh, Sister Randy Johnson uh, and her cancer treatment. I've seen that she had posted uh, online the other day that she had got some new uh, treatment options and she was, uh, uh, her spirits sinking very high. So uh, praise the Lord for that. That's answered prayers, I feel. And uh, Sister Chandra, I mean Shonda, uh, Dana Jones, which is Sister Chandra's, uh, Chandra's mom. Mike and Lynn Smith, Sister Robin's family, Pastor Jerry's uh, family, that's uh, Stephen passed away, uh, Sister Leslie Caleb and Cam Robertson, Lace, Sister Donna Shoecraft, continue recovery, Brother Kevin Jules, continue recovery, Sister Andrea, Randy, and Walt Johnson, Brother Troy Noel, uh, continue to pray for Brother Troy. Sister Nancy Hogan's continued recovery. Please pray for those with chronic health issues. Uh, yes, a lot of those going on. I have diabetes myself, so remember me. And Brother Jimmy, he had chronic diabetes, so let's remember all these people that uh, have uh, continued problems that we have to deal with daily. Uh, Please lift up and remember the elderly, the sick, and the shut in, as we always should be doing that. That's what the Bible teaches us, pure religion, uh, to uh, pray for them and take care of uh, these in those situations. And it's something we should practice every day. Uh, pray for the street ministry. Uh, see Sister uh, Mikhail or Brother David uh, for any information on their upcoming times for whenever they can uh, go out and preach on the streets. Uh, pray for the prison ministry. And if you're interested, see Brother Joe, give him your information. I believe you uh, need your uh, full name, uh, maybe address, uh, social, security. social security number to do a background check if you're interested in the prison ministry. Pray for, uh, pray the Lord rises up a five-fold ministry in our local assembly and globally in the body of Christ. How important that is. Pray God would continue to send laborers who will stay, listen, learn, and serve. Amen. Sister Lynn, what do you have? Um, John had an announcement, but if you guys would like to pray
mention today, God, uh, Lord, that you just uh, uh, show them in, the, in, in their later life, God, that you're working uh, for them, God. Uh, we just ask you, Lord, to be with each one of those dare travels uh, from here uh, to home and back tonight. Uh, God, Lord, we just pray for our pastor as he's out, Lord, ministering, uh, Lord, preaching your word, God, that, Lord, that you would give him safe travel, uh, Lord, that you give him souls for his labor. Lord, we just ask you, God, Lord, to be with each one of us. Lord, we ask you to save our lives, uh, Lord, to heal our sick, Lord, to deliver those that need delivering. Lord, in Jesus' name we pray. Lord, bless this ministry. Lord, take it and use it, God. Take our worship and, Lord, accept it as an acceptable gift to you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. I was a witch, I remember who 